Okay, class, uh, we should start. So, as always, begin, uh, I want to start with announcements and reminders. Um, there is this homework that's on uh, available on Canvas, homework four. Uh, it's all about learning theory. We'll be covering a good part of what you need to know for that homework today. I hope to finish VC dimension today. If not, there'll be a little spillover for Tuesday. For Tuesday. Um, and then there's a project milestone that's due today. Uh, the idea is you make at least one non-dummy submission on Kaggle, and you feel free to use the code from your homeworks and all that. Uh, and you should also submit a report. You should do both. Uh, if you do one but not the other, we will have to take points away. So you need to do both, and please do use Canvas for discussions. Um, and the other thing I wanted to announce is uh, not written here, but uh, on popular demand, um, the can the Kaggle leaderboard is not entirely meaningless. So the top three people on the Kaggle leaderboard will get extra ten points on the can on the projects part of the score. So remember, it's ten points for the project, which gets scaled down to fifteen percent. So it's like you know one point five points overall, whatever that means. So this is for the this is just to kind of give an incentive for people to uh, try to get to the top of the leaderboard. Um, yes. No, uh, you're allowed to use one algorithm. One out of the six can be anything. Okay. Uh, so before I actually, while I do uh, want to do that, just to incentivize people to submit stuff and play with the data. I want to get some uh, uh, show of hands from the class. How many people think this is a bad idea? How many people think this is a good idea? Because usually people don't like to disagree with the professor. Any concerns or complaints do people have? Yes. Uh, I think it could be a little nicer if it would restricted to the best score with something that you made for this class. Uh, so people might have really strong backgrounds in using libraries. Right. Uh, Okay, uh, the, the, so the, the comment is uh, uh, we need to restrict it to algorithms that we cover in class, basically five out of those six. Yeah, well, let's go to the college of like where... implementation. Now, uh, I see the value of your uh, comment and I actually uh, morally agree with that point. The only issue is that it's going to make giving those 10 points so much difficult, so much more difficult that I might actually just not do it at all. Uh, that's the trade-off, yes. What does that, what does that mean? No, no, I, I'm kind of curious. Like you don't want to... Oh, I see. I see. Uh, do you have any thoughts, Hashim? Uh, I see. Uh, incentive people to play around with the data and maybe learn more algorithms, but I also agree on that. But it makes sense. Yeah. So maybe that also ties to the other point I wanted to make today. I withdraw the announcement. Okay. There are a few people who made those suggestions, but I'm I appreciate your comments, and I think uh, uh, I don't want to add to your stress and anxiety because this I know that enough of that going around in the class anyway. Um, so let's not, so uh, everything that I said in the last 10 minutes about incentivizing being on the leaderboard, let's pretend I never said that. <laughs> so just because I don't want to add to your stress. Yes. Um, going back to pretending where, we, where this is already the case, uh -huh. would those top three, would that interest be awarded at the end of the semester or at the end of every month? At the end of the semester, of course. Uh, I heard your voice. So, you, did you have something to say? Yeah. Okay. I like how you're thinking. So, I I encourage you to try it. You know why? Because your data set is just a list of features. So. I would be curious to know if chat GPT actually looks at a list of uh, hundred and something numbers and figures out the label, because if it does, um, I'd like to know that. 
Huh? If it does, then maybe there's a paper there. Uh, so, on the other hand, there's another point I want to mention with chat, using ChatGPT. Uh, how many data points are in the test set? 1500 or something. Okay, so 1500 points in the test set. There are two ways of using ChatGPT. Either you sit in the front of the computer and copy paste 1500 times and look for the response, or you use the API. If you copy paste 1500 times, you need to visit a doctor because you'll have carpal tunnel syndrome. Uh, if you use the API, you need to pay money, which I don't really want you to have to pay money to get a grade in the class because that, that makes no sense. So, you know, it's interesting. It's an interesting thought, but uh, let's not go there. Um, yes. I think it could help if there was more than two spots because in class this size, we people yeah but i i actually want to talk a bit about stress because uh that i've had like at least five or six people reach out to me about how stressful this class is and it is i'm not pretending it's not this is one of the more difficult classes that many of you might have taken um i don't think anyone came to this class thinking it would be an easy a did anyone <laughs> oh wait there's a question on uh, there's another comment uh on on uh, zoom saying uh, no points based on leaderboard status um there's a question on the project that i'll get to after this discussion um so this is not an easy class so and i noticed that people are getting rather stressed about uh things like the midterm which by any measure was not, shall we say, it was not the easiest midterm you might have faced. Um, and also the fact that, you know, it, it takes a lot of work up front because you need to set up your code, you need to run those experiments and machine learning bugs are the worst bugs to fix. Like literally the worst thing you can do in your life is fixing code, fixing statistical libraries because, because there's a random number generator in there. So, I have a few things I wanted to share on that. First of all, it is stressful, but a lot of the work is front loaded and you kind of get payoffs as you go along because you can keep, you end up reusing your code as you go along for your projects. And as we will see, uh, when the, your next homework will involve uh, support vector machines, which I like to tell students the support vector machine implementation that I ask you to do is like, I think, two lines of code different from your perceptron implementation. If you know which two lines and write the two correct two lines. Uh, and uh, logistic regression will be some similarly kind of minor variant. And you'll be using those in your projects as well. So that's the first point. You'll be reusing your code multiple times. The second one is expectations with respect to the project milestone that's due today. Let's say that you have an algorithm that uh, you use and you upload some results and you find that it doesn't really work. It, your results are as good as the baseline. Now, if you make an honest effort, I'm not going to penalize you for that at this stage. I'll tell you why. My goal is not that you get the right numbers, whatever that might be, for let's say average perceptron on this data. My goal is for you to have tried to use average perceptron or whatever algorithm that you pick on this data and explore things and get you know, get going with the project early enough. At the end of the semester, uh, you get to choose your six official permissions. So for example, what might happen is maybe you chose, you ran average perceptron and you found that there's a bug in your code and it's not doing as well as, maybe you talk to your friends and you find there's not, it's not doing as well as uh, other people's average perceptron. And maybe next week you find the bug and you fix it. You can upload it again, and that gives you, an, uh, av that could be your official submission for average perceptron, right? I will not penalize you for this thing. Here, I want you to have made the submission rather than have made the right submission. So the, that's the first point. The second thing is uh, uh, with respect to projects and homeworks and everything in the class, I encourage you to form study groups. Study groups help a lot. What you should not do is have one person nominate one person in the study group to write the assignment for everyone and just create five copies and submit it. Uh, that is a problem. And I hope you see why. Um, well, the, the, 
there are two kinds of problems here. The first one is you don't learn anything by doing that. And the second one is you will fail the class uh, because I will find it and I'll send you for the class if you do that. So don't do that. But form study groups. It's going to help. Study groups are, uh, you know, they, they, this is a rather diverse class in terms of backgrounds. That means that different people might have familiarity with different things. One person might be like incredibly familiar with, uh, uh, with, uh, with you know, linear algebra and probability, but not so much with say programming. Another person might be so good at programming, but have trouble with uh, you know statistics. Well, let your powers combine, um, and you can. There's a there's some value in teaching each other when we are in a class of this size. Uh, I strongly, strongly encourage that. So it also kind of will reduce this sense of isolation that one might feel that, you know, I'm the only one having trouble with this class. I assure you, for any one of you, you're not the only one having trouble with this class. We are all having trouble with this class. Um, you with uh, the midterm, me with grading the midterm. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, uh, but the, the other, uh, so the, that's the thing, you know, form study groups. It's, it's going to be helpful, really helpful. Um, I, in the most difficult classes I have taken as a student, I found that study groups made those classes both easier and enjoyable. And along the way, I made some friends that I still have. So, you know, it's just a win-win. The third or fourth, some not the end point that I wanted to make was this class is, the final grades are going to be curved. Um, so if you, the score that you see now, is not going to be the final score. So I'll be after the midterm scores are released, I'll be changing things on Canvas to make it clear what each part of your the, the your uh, submissions contribute to the final uh, score. We've already talked about that in the first lecture when I went over the syllabus. But roughly speaking, every homework gives you ten or fifteen, ten or eleven points uh, for the final. If you think of the final hundred points, every homework uh, is valued at ten or eleven. The project and is at 15, uh, I think the midterm and the final are at 10 each. So imagine, for example, that uh, in the midterm, you score 50 points. Not, I don't even have a clue what the median is. I'm just making that up. That means that out of the 10 points, 10%, you have five. So you've lost five points in the total 100. Think of it that way. There's a bulk of scoring opportunities coming up. So once again, please don't stress about things. I mean, it's it, it, it's, this is a very, very fun subject. I love this uh, subject so much because it's so entertaining. Uh, so I want you to see that side of it rather than think of it as I need to score grades because you know the, the point is at the end of the semester, I want you to have learned something cool and so that you can go and do things that are, you know, that I can't think of. Yes. When you have a curve of the class, are you gonna do like a rise of tide when it's like so low that I want to shift the curve or are you can actually like Adjust like, um, basically, what I do is I look for clusters of uh, grades uh, so that there is very, very close uh, uh, in terms of number of points does not translate to uh, uh, different grades. So there, I look for big gaps in between and uh, just normalize based on that. That's roughly my algorithm. I mean, there's some sort of like all curving, there's always some sort of heuristic stuff, but that's roughly what it is. Uh, I had another uh, n plus one point to make about this, but uh, I can't remember that now. But the short version is don't stress out about the class. There's a bulk of scoring opportunity going ahead. Uh, and the reason I'm making this uh, speech right now is because in the last week, I've had like five different students reach out to me saying, this class is very stressful. And uh, that you know, as an instructor, that doesn't make me feel happy. And I'm not saying, if you do feel stressed, please reach out to me. Don't worry about my happiness. I'll deal with it. Uh, uh, but, you know, just let me know things are stressful. And, you know, we are here to help you. My TAs are here to help you. Uh, come to office hours, come to their office hours, come to my office hours, and form study groups and use Canvas and all these discussion forums. We also have created these extra office hours on Fridays for people who can't make it on the other uh, days. The Friday one is slightly different, right? Because it's by appointment. 
and but still it's uh, good to uh, take advantage of those any sort of questions around any of these things i see that uh, there's a whole bunch of questions on on zoom um okay i think ashim has taken care of all of that okay yes that uh, uh, it's, MIT terms, so. it's not a question of generous my concern with that is that becomes very subjective and i i'm not fond of these if it makes a difference in the grade thing because that it's almost like if i like that person i'm going to give them a grade uh, i don't want to do that but uh, it's a I like the way you're thinking. The, the interesting suggestions. I'm not uh, I'm just not going to follow up on that, but I, uh, yeah, I, I don't want to do that. Okay. Um, any other questions, comments about any of these things? Uh, yes. Are you planning to do uniform curve for the entirety of the class, or are you planning to divide it based off of grads and undergrads? Grads and undergrads are in different buckets. Um, Grads and undergrads won't be evaluated in the same thing. All right. Uh, one other thing that I have as an announcement, which is uh, uh, kind of not about the class, but about an event that's happening on campus today. Uh, it's been it's 50 years since the CS department was created, and there's a celebration happening uh, today and tomorrow. A bunch of talks, bunch of very big names. Ivan Sutherland's uh, giving a talk at 4 p.m. today. He's a Turing Award winner, former uh, Utah professor. Uh, John Warnock, who graduated from Utah in 1969, and then went on to have a rather, uh, you know, he founded Adobe. Uh, so he's kind of uh, um, had a good life. He's giving a talk about his life as a student, I think, tomorrow. Uh, also, it's next, it's next week. Okay, so everything's next week. So, uh, uh, yes, of course, I can't tell dates, right? Um, yes, you're right. So this is next week. Uh, I'll mention this again. Not today, not tomorrow. This is next Thursday, and then next Friday. Yes, you're right. But uh, you may have to register for this event. So I don't know if this is uh, full. I don't know if this is open for students. But no harm in going. Uh, if they ask you to leave, well, we'll figure it out. Um, this is supposed to celebrate the fact that the CS department has been here in Utah for, uh, you know, longer than all of us have been alive. So that's kind of cool. So, you know, uh, check it out. All right. Um, yeah, you, this is, that's right. It's next week. Uh, 25th here, 23rd and 24th, of course. Uh, you may have to go to price.utah.edu to uh, get more details. There's like a list of talks and the entire schedule of events for the whole two days. And I think, but I can't be sure that uh, if you register ahead of time, and I don't know if this is for everyone or only for faculty, I'm not going to say what it is. There was promise of lunch, but uh, I don't know if it's only for faculty. Who knows? Check it out. I mean, there's uh, the details on the website. All right. Anything on? Uh... Uh, yes. What's the best score I've seen on Canvas, on Kaggle for uh, the class? I have not looked at it this morning. When I last saw it, the highest score I saw was 83%. You should be able to see the number on the public leaderboard. Yeah, you should be able to. What is it now? Yeah. Sorry? 84.2? Okay, so that's the highest score we've seen on on Kaggle so far. It, oh, I have ever seen on any project. I don't understand. Um, it depends on the data set, it depends on the class, and it's just so variable that I, there's no comparison there. All right. Um, let's get back to where we were. I mean, uh, enough about logistics and all such things, unless people want to discuss more on that. I see no raised hand, so let's let's get back to where we were. We were talking about agnostic learning. Just to remind you where we were, uh, 
we were talking about the situation where uh, we drop the assumption that the learner has the ability to find the true concept. In other words, the learner is going to search for a concept without knowing whether its search space actually contains it or not. And the question that we are asking is, what can, what's the best, uh, what can we do? Can we say anything formal about that setting? And to analyze this, we started looking at tail bounds. In particular, we, uh, uh, I suggested that we're gonna take advantage of uh, this thing called, the, called Hefting's inequality, which says the probability that the uh, true mean for a Bernoulli trial, like a coin toss, is going to be more than epsilon away from the empirical mean computed using m different trials is less than e power 2m epsilon square. So uh, this is going to be like the key tool that we'll use. And what this tells us is really that the empirical mean is not going to be too far off because e power minus m, that's the two epsilon square, but e power minus m drops very, very quickly as m increases. So as m is the number of trials, as the number of trials increases, this upper bound is going to get really small, which means this quantity on the left-hand side is going to get even smaller. So it tells us how fast this convergence happens. So we're gonna use this, we started using this for um, uh, analyzing agnostic learning. And the, the analogy that I kind of elaborated on uh, at the end of the last lecture was the quantity of interest is this thing here, the generalization error of a hypothesis, error D, that's, uh, it says error D on the slide. The generalization error of a hypothesis is a quantity that we do not have access to. We cannot measure it because we do not know the distribution. Remember, in fact, we don't assume that we, we know the distribution that generates the data. So we're going to, in doing this analysis, what we will do is we will pretend that the generalization error is, the, is a random variable. And we are going to ask how far can empirical estimates of that random variable be away from the true uh, uh, mean for that random variable. So just to remind you, the generalization error is simply defined as the probability that the true label for any example is not equal to the predicted label for that example according to a hypothesis where the, the examples are drawn from that distribution. The empirical error, this is the empirical error, The empirical error is simply the fraction of training examples, a fraction of examples in a set that are misclassified. So the number of examples where h of x and f of x are different divided by the number of examples that we have. What Hefting's inequality tells us is, oh, interesting. What Hefting's inequality tells us is that the uh, generalization error, the probability that the generalization error is more then epsilon away from the uh, the training error is less than e power minus two m epsilon square, where m now is the number of training examples we have because we are computing this over m examples. So there are m trials. Each trial is a particular training example, and we we have a hypothesis and we ask on this example is the hypothesis correct or not? On this one is it correct or not? So we are asking it again and again uh, for uh, an estimate of that random variable. On some of them, it's going to be right. On some of them, it's going to be wrong. So we can measure how often is it wrong. That gives us the empirical error. If we have an infinite number of uh, training examples, if M is infinity, even without this bound here, we know that the training error is going to give us the generalization error. Because if we have an infinite number of examples, we have seen all the data that can exist potentially. And measuring the uh, you know, estimating the error, the counting the number of uh, uh, mistakes divided by, in this case, infinity, there's a limit there, is by the law of large numbers defined to be the probability that your classifier is wrong. What can you do with finite number of examples? The reason this expression is interesting is because the, the generalization error is what we want to measure, what we want to estimate. 
we can measure, we can actually, given a data set and a classifier, we can count its, uh, we can estimate its training error. So if you have a train, let's say you have a classifier and its training error is say 0.1. This expression, the expression inside the probability is asking, what's the probability that the generalization error is one plus epsilon, some small number more than epsilon. Because if it is too large beyond epsilon, that's a problem. We want the training error to be, the generalization error to be small. So the problem, and this expression says the probability that it's going to be some small number beyond the training error is going to be really small if your number of training examples is small. This is roughly where we stopped uh, on Tuesday. Any questions about just the intuition? We're going to build on top of this and uh, wrap it up with a theorem. Yes. It seems that it's going to be possible. Uh, we are assuming epsilon is positive here. Yeah. Uh, for the simple reason, this is the same epsilon that we will use for uh, the pack uh, learning. Epsilon is the number between zero and one. So the question was, if your training error is zero, then you get a consistent model. And then do we get back the same bound as we Will we get the same bound as we did for the consistent setting? Keep that question in your pocket. We'll come back to that once we finish the bound. I'll show you a comparison. The short answer is no, because here we have there we have more information, so we can actually use that information to get a tighter bound. Okay. So another way to restate that expression is that the probability that a single hypothesis, any single hypothesis, this is true for any hypothesis. I did not say that uh, uh, this hypothesis that we are considering is the best one, it's the worst one. It's true for any expression, any classifier. For any classifier, the probability that it has a training error uh, that's more than epsilon uh, away from the true error is bounded here. The learning algorithm picks one out of the hypothesis space, one hypothesis from the hypothesis space. It can pick, ideally, we want it will pick the best one, however best is defined. There are H possible hypotheses and the learning algorithm picks one out of them, capital H possible hypothesis. So we're going to apply the union bound once again. We've already encountered the union bound. If this expression is true for one particular hypothesis, the probability that there exists some hypothesis whose training error is epsilon away from the generalization error is simply is upper bounded by the number of hypotheses we have times this right hand side here. Because this, we are basically adding this up the size, number of hypotheses times. So that's the union bound here. Questions before we uh, use this thing? What the expression at the bottom is saying is the probability that for some hypothesis, each generalization error is more than epsilon away from the training error is bounded on top by this quantity here. That hypothesis, let's say we have some hypothesis that behaves that way. Let's call that H1. Let's say H1 is a classifier that has low training error, but somehow its generalization error is more than epsilon away from the training error. It looks much better on the training data than it does in the future. So that classifier, that particular hypothesis might end up pulling the learning algorithm because the learning, the training data might convince the learners that this particular hypothesis H1 has is really good. And yet when it's applied on future data, its error is going to be more than epsilon plus whatever the training error was. What we would like is we would like to ask, can I somehow make that probability really small? Can I somehow make sure that with high probability, my learning algorithm does not find that one bad hypothesis that can be easily fooled by the learn, uh, by the training data. This is the same game that we played before. It should seem familiar. Uh, if it does not, we're going to revisit it. We, we are going to, we are, I'm going to go through this now and you might make the connections to what we saw before. So this is a statement for some hypothesis, the probability that its error is, um, uh, it's, it's generalization error or true error is more than epsilon away from the training error is bounded on top by size of x times e power minus two m epsilon square. 
So that's really what it is. The probability that some hypothesis we are we are entertaining, the learner is entertaining some the a hypothesis the whose generalization is error is really bad is bounded on top. This is a bad situation. We don't want this to happen. So we can ask, what does it make? What what should I do to make sure that this is improbable? We cannot guarantee that it is impossible because it is quite likely that we are sitting on a training set that is just adversarial, that is just designed to fool the learning algorithm. So all we can ask is, what's the problem? What can we do to make this situation that is circled here improbable? What does it mean to make it improbable? I want it to have low probability. What can I do to make it have low probability? One thing I can do is to, rather than considering the probability of this, this probability here, I can ask, what if this quantity itself is less than some delta? And let's say delta is really small. If this quantity is less than delta, clearly this quantity is less than delta, which means it's going to be improbable. So we are asking, what does it take to make the situation of some hypothesis having a really bad generalization error improbable? In order to do that, I'm going to uh, ask, I'm going to put an, uh, 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 an upper bound of delta on like an upper bound of the probability. So we, it's the same thing that we did before. So we are, we want this probability to be smaller than delta. So I, instead of that, I'm going to ask this, if this expression is less than delta, then this expression is less than delta. So with high, which means with high probability, learning will succeed. Questions before I, uh, everything after this is just algebra. So this is really the only conceptual part of questions. Um, is, is that inequality also something for the absolute? This thing here? Yeah, I, I, I know it should be added to like that. Yeah, so yes. That get added? Oh, well, how did that get in? Yeah, I know, right? Uh, the, that's, that's the trick that I pulled from here to here. The Huffington's inequality is for one hypothesis, little h. Your capital H consists of many of them. Let's say we have H1 or H2 or H3. Let's say our hypothesis space consists of only three things. Okay. Then for H1, I can say the probability of error. Yeah, I'm going to make it at this point. I don't have space. So let's use a new page. So let's say I have uh, my hypothesis space consists of H1 h2 and h3 so i can say probability of error d of h1 is greater than is less than right that's true for h1 but i never said this is true only for h1 it could also be true for let's see if i do this right It could also be true for H2. Or H3. It's true for all three of them. Right? This is true for all of them. And now, what I would like is probability that there exists some H in H, such that the whole thing. Another way of saying that is probability that H1 is bad or H2 is bad or H3 is bad. This quantity is less than equal to H1 is the probability that H1 is bad is less than that, H2 is bad is less than that. So you get three times three because this is the three because this is the size of H. Uh, my next question then is if you if you have enough examples that make any age have this low probability of like if you have an infinite number of examples that is uh, uh, your uh, I have to be careful what I say here. Let me first restate the question that as I understand it, and then I'll try to answer it and you can tell me if I got the question right. The question was, nothing in these expressions says 
that it is this H or that H. So which means which is it this is this implying that all classifiers are good if you have enough number of examples? The answer is not so much because what this is saying is let me go back to a printed version of this so that you don't have to suffer my handwriting. Um, what the expression in on the top is saying here is for any classifier, whether it's good or not, the probability that it will be much worse in the future than it was in the training is bounded on top. It's entirely possible that that classifier is really, really bad during training. So it's only comparing training versus future okay. and not absolute future. I mean, uh, 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 the future performance in an absolute sense. Yes. I have a question about why do we consider all the hypotheses in the case? Because I can see that, like, we just use error B of A to error S of A. I get that, you know, error S is going to be different. Yeah, yeah. And error B might be good. If we're going to eventually get a hypothesis, right. why do we need it? Why do we need to make a statement about all classifiers when we eventually we just find one classifier, one hypothesis? And that we only need to make a statement about that one hypothesis. The reason for that is the style of this proof is it does not know which data set is going to show up and which learning algorithm is going to show up. So the, it's making a statement about any data set, any learning algorithm, whether it's good or not, is going to behave this way. And that means it's a statement about all hypotheses. It's a really it's a worst case statement. In the worst case, even if your learning algorithm is really bad and picks a suboptimal classifier, it's going to have this property. In an ideal world, it will pick a good classifier, which means this thing will get stronger, but that analysis is harder to do. And so uh, is the hypothesis, all the hypotheses outputs of the learning function, not like, for example, perceptron, it's every single possible output of a perceptron algorithm, not every single possible uh, linear discussion. Every single linear classifier is a hypothesis. The perceptron algorithm is free to pick any one of them, right? We don't know upfront. Without even seeing a data set, you cannot tell which linear classifier will get chosen. And that's the situation we are in. We are not looking at this data set or that data set. Our data set is truly sampled IID. So we have no control over that. And that's why we have to do this sort of worst case behavior. Okay. So any other questions? If not, I want to move on. So we want to bound this right-hand side by uh, the by delta. At this point, all we have is algebra. So I'm going to just go over it a little quickly. I can take log on both sides. So I have log size of h minus 2m epsilon square is less than or equal to delta log delta log delta, I can rewrite it as this quantity is the same as log one over delta, but with a minus sign here, these two are the same. So I'm going to remove this and move this up. And uh, I, I bring this quantity, this side and that, that side. So I have log size of H plus log one over delta is less than two M epsilon square. I can now bring the two M the epsilon square here and the two here and it becomes one over. So if M is greater than this quantity here, then life is good. So let's kind of rephrase what I did, uh, restate. If this property holds, if X, the size of X times E power minus two M epsilon square is less than delta, then with high probability, our class, we will not uh, have a, a classifier that have, whose generalization error is really bad, really worse than the training error. So we will not have a bad classifier. Equivalently, uh, from here all the way to here is just reorganizing. So this statement and this statement are identical. So I can say this in a different way. If M is greater than this expression here, then we will not have a classifier that is uh, with high probability will not have a classifier that's fooled by the training set. So let's restate that. If M greater than one over two epsilon squared log size of H plus log one over delta, then 
um, we will, with high probability, we won't have a classifier whose training error is much worse than its generalization error. I don't think the going from here to here is really the interesting part. That is the most boring part of this group. It's literally just reorganizing, so I don't want to dwell on that. And instead, we have an interesting expression at the bottom, and I'd like to spend a bit of time trying to understand uh, what it means. So let's spend a bit of a few minutes trying to interpret that expression. Now, an agnostic learner does not uh, demand that the true concept belongs to the its search space. It can search over a set of functions without knowing whether the true concept belongs there or not. And now it says, uh, let's say that in, in the process of its search, it returns the classifier that has the lowest training error over these m examples. If the number of examples it uh, has is more than this expression here, then the guarantee says the, with high probability, with probability one minus delta, the generalization error is not more than epsilon away than the training error. And if you chose the lowest training error, then you are essentially close to the best you could do with this data. So if you have these many examples, then in the future, your classifier will behave not too differently than it did during the training time. That's the guarantee that's this theorem gets, provided you have these many examples. Now notice that this is very much like the other expression that you saw before. Um, we have an epsilon. The epsilon here is not the same as the epsilon there. The epsilon there was the generalization error. Here is the additional error that you encountered at generalization time over the training error. It's basically the gap between the training and the generalization error. How much worse will the classifier be in the future than it was during training? That's the epsilon. Size of edge is it plays an important factor. As the size of edge increases, m the demand uh, on uh, the number of examples increases. In other words, if you want your learner to explore a large set of functions, then and you want this guarantee, then you want to have uh, you know you you better have a lot of examples. Because m should m increases logarithmically as the size of h, and uh, same sort of properties that we saw before show up. If you have a function class whose uh, uh, if you like set of all Boolean functions, there are two power two power n Boolean functions. The log of that is still two power n. Um, you require an exponential number of examples for this guarantee. The third term here is this delta, which I have not highlighted. Delta is really uh, one minus delta is the guarantee uh, that learning will succeed. I can rearrange this expression and kind of uh, reinterpret this slightly differently uh, to get something uh, that's a generalization box. This noting that this epsilon is really the difference between the generalization error and the training error. What we have, I can reorganize this expression and say that the generalization error is go is less than equal to the training error plus this expression here. I'm not going to bother reading it because, well, this is just too too much notation to read. But um, if you have more than m examples, then with high probability, your generalization error is not going to be more than that thing in the box plus your training error. That's really what. That's another way of interpreting the exact same uh, expression. Pro now, this means that to achieve very low uh, extra error, meaning this gap between training and generalization error, you can do one of three things. You can make your uh, size of edge small. If size of edge is small, this thing in the box decreases. So your, uh, generaliz your generalization performance won't be too worse. You could increase the number of training examples. If M increases, once again, the thing in the box decreases. So again, generalization error will not be too far out. Or you could uh, you could give up your uh, expectation that learning will succeed. Delta being, if delta becomes small, no, if delta becomes large, this expression becomes small. Yes. Epsilon was this gap here. This difference. Epsilon is the difference between uh, the training error and the generalization error.
we are we are essentially treating epsilon that way yes so this is another way to interpret the same uh, kind of result okay um questions yeah we can but that doesn't tell us anything about generalization error it just says generalization error is going to be no worse than the really bad classifier but i don't want that i want it to be as small as possible yes it is stronger but the, the stronger part is a little not so useful okay um we've seen let's kind of step back up and revisit what you've seen before when the hypothesis space contains the true concept this was the first occam's razor for proof that we saw when the hypothesis space contains the true concept we had this uh, uh, bound that said if you have these many examples then we can guarantee this epsilon delta behavior in the agnostic learning this is also an occam's razor because it depends on size of it uh, when the true when if we give up on this knowledge that the hypothesis space contains the concept then your it's basically the same expression right it's the thing in the brackets are identical here you have one over epsilon here you have one over two epsilon square when epsilon is really small the thing at the bottom is larger that answers your question from before not having that extra piece of information means that you have to pay a bit more price because this uh, this quantity is going to be larger so one way or another what this really says is learnability depends on the log of the size of the hypothesis space right okay the question to you is are we done can you apply this to your linear classifiers and if not why not and maybe someone who's not answered before should take this up uh, speak up speak up so that's the point the the set of linear class log of the size of h if h is linear classifiers how many a linear classifier is uniquely defined by its weight vector well not uniquely you can kind of scale things up and down but it's defined by its weight vector how many weight vectors are there in d dimension an infinite number what is log of infinite still infinite so to achieve to do anything meaningful according to this theorem or uh, these theorems it says if you have an infinite number of examples life is good um, if you have an infinite number of examples life is really good um, so yes they are slightly different but actually the epsilon at the top is you can think of it uh, let me tell you why they are the same their, their their interpretation might be slightly different but actually they are identical i'll tell you why the epsilon at the bottom is uh generalization error minus train error uh, let me write this with a different color this epsilon is generalization error minus and this epsilon is just generalization error so it seems like these are different right on the other hand remember at the top the training error is zero because we are assuming that the learner finds a classifier that's consistent to the training data so this quantity is zero so they are the same so we've not solved everything we still have some ways to go um sure but then if the, the the question is there are only a finite number of linear classifiers sure we don't really we may be working with real numbers but in practice we never work with real numbers because we have computers that store bits and so anything you have you have discretized but if that were the case using floating 16 bit floating point numbers is going to be better than using 32 bit floating point numbers because there are fewer such linear classifiers 
And so as your num numeric precision increases, learnability gets harder, which is so weird. Which is, but that's not, that, that doesn't work. Either. So it's not exactly right. This is a problem, right? You can't apply any of this for infinite hypothesis. Well, it's not really a problem uh, because when I started this whole section, I assumed that we have a finite set of functions. So it's our fault to even try to apply this to linear classifiers. We need to invent a new kind of theory to address these sorts of models. And that's going to be the topic of the next lecture unless there are